From robbing a gas station with a Nintendo zapper gun, to threatening to bomb a Splatoon tournament, all the way to a man sent to prison for brandishing a sharpened master sword in public, Nintendo fans and haters alike have been responsible for some pretty kooky criminal activity. Today we'll be taking a look at some of the most offbeat cases. When a love or hate for Nintendo ends in tragic consequences, this is the wacky world of Nintendo crime. Alright, look y'all, I gotta level with you, look. As somewhat of a gamer myself, I realize that our food choices are not always optimal. And you can do better, as I have, with Factor. Let's get this bullshit out of here. Fuck that shit. Factor makes hitting your nutritional goals easy and ships fresh, never frozen meals right to your front door. All you gotta do is put them in the microwave for a couple of minutes and bam, you got a damn near restaurant quality meal ready to be devoured. Factor has a bunch of different options when it comes to meals, like keto, calorie smart, and vegan, and vegetarian. But my option of choice is Protein Plus. I'm loving these high protein meals, man. Factor is keeping your boy swole. Tasty protein is pretty hard to come by, but Factor has been a lifesaver for when I need a quick meal after workouts or if I'm below my daily goal. Next, I've got this black pepper and sage pork chop with smoked Gouda Brussels sprouts and creamy broccoli. I'm so glad that I'm recording this Factor ad today because I have literally no groceries and Factor, of course, is coming in clutch as they do with this, this pork. Let's go. Mm. Dude, I couldn't make anything like this good. And my protein's covered for the day. I love it. The seasonings are going crazy right now. Nice herb taste. The games are going crazy over here. It's like blasting off like the flavors on my tongue right now. You guys can head to factor75.com, click the link below and use code wavy50 to get 50% off your first factor box and 20% off your next month of orders. A UK man was sentenced to four months in prison for carrying a six inch master sword in public. It's a well known fact that the United Kingdom has some of the strictest weapon control laws in the entire world. While most people cite their restrictions on guns, carrying other weapons such as knives in public is heavily frowned upon. According to the UK government, it's illegal to carry any knife that could be used as a weapon in public unless it's for a quote good reason. This is often determined by courts, but an example they provided was using it for work work or religious purposes. Laws such as these come across as extremely overbearing to citizens of the United States, with it becoming a meme to mock their insistence on having a license to do even the most basic of tasks. While often exaggerated, one British gamer would unfortunately be on the receiving end of these harsh penalties. On June 8th, a 48-year-old man named Anthony Bray was strolling through the town center of New Neaton, England, going about his day as normal. However, CCTV operators noticed something strange about him. It appeared that the man was holding a suspicious object, which was perceived to be some sort of weapon. According to an official report published by UK police, they approached the man and noticed he had a quote, bladed article, unquote, in his hand. Considering this an urgent threat, they swiftly took action, apprehending the man in an effort to prevent any violent crimes from occurring. On paper, it seemed as though they were upholding the UK strict knife control laws and stopping yet another violent criminal. There was only one issue though. The bladed article in question was in fact a six inch long replica of the Master Sword from the Legend of Zelda franchise. As stated earlier, the UK government disapproves the carrying of any object that could potentially be used as a weapon, stating the only other exception to this would be one carrying a small pocket knife under three inches long. Anthony denied the accusations that he was in possession of a weapon, describing the sword as a fidget toy. After thorough questioning, the man did admit how someone could potentially be threatened by him holding it, but still denied any wrongdoing. Despite this, he was sentenced to four months in prison and forced to pay a hefty fine for his crime. Suffice to say, the internet's initial reaction to this headline was ridicule. While the police were correct in the assertion that it could potentially have been used in the same way a knife would be used, the fact that it was a toy replica of a fictional sword led many to express outrage at the harsh sentencing. A Reddit thread discussing the incident was created on r slash United Kingdom, with the top comment reading, quote, this seems a bit ridiculous to me. He's obviously an idiot playing with it in public, but it seems like the sort of thing a fine and a bit of community service would be good for. 
not four months in prison. What a waste of time and money. However, this story isn't nearly as black and white as it may seem on the surface. One Redditor in the comments pointed out that this was far from Anthony's first criminal offense, linking to a 2011 article from Coventry Live as evidence. As the story goes, Bray was known for being a, quote, serial burglar who had attempted to carry out several robberies in the New Neaton area. His strategy was to simply walk into homes with unlocked doors at times when they would most likely be asleep, then pretend that he was simply looking for someone if he got caught by the resident. According to the article, the man had been in and out of the prison system for years, first being jailed in 1989 and proceeded to get into legal trouble after a string of burglaries that took place between 2001 and 2009. The final straw had been the attempted burglary in 2011, with the man being jailed for four years. While it's unclear as to whether he had committed any serious crimes in the decade leading up to his master sword arrest, Rest, the fact that he had essentially been a career criminal for a long period of time led many to become much less sympathetic to the story. It's also important to note that knife crime is an incredibly serious issue that continues to plague the United Kingdom. An article written by PC Gamer pointed out that the area Bray lived in had some of the highest rates of knife crime in the entire country. This provides some important context that some internet users may have missed out on regarding this story. But the incident is still baffling to those out outside observers who are from other countries, with more lax laws surrounding bladed weapons. Our population, um, to keep him safe, they kept him in, a, um, in isolation. And so he was kept in isolation. It's no secret, when it comes to students, high schoolers are some of the most unruly. Between bad attitudes and a slew of easy to hide devices such as phones at their disposals, teachers have a harder job these days than ever trying to get these students to lock in. With that said, this story involves a student who was caught playing his Nintendo Switch during school. And when it was found, he was warned by teachers. But this was no ordinary high school shakedown, as the act of confronting him about this switch sent the gamer into an enraged state, ending in dire consequences for the high school faculty. In February 2023, at Matanzas High School, a 17-year-old student named Brendan Deppa brought his Nintendo Switch to school. Deppa was said to have been using the Switch in class and causing something of a disturbance. That's when Joanne Nadich, a teacher's aide, would report the Switch, which led to Deppa being confronted about it by his main teacher. Normally, this would be where the story ended, but this interaction caused Deppa to become furious. In surveillance footage later released to the public, you can clearly see Brendan lunging at Joanne Nadich, immediately knocking her over. Despite quickly losing consciousness, Brendan continued to hit her over and over again, only stopping after multiple other school faculty members physically pulled him away. Keep in mind that according to official reports, Brendan was 6'6 six six and weighed 200 170 pounds, making the attack all the more horrific as there was absolutely no way for the woman to defend herself. Police were quickly called and the teen was arrested immediately with Brendan complaining and disparaging the officers the entire time. Stand up for me. Put your hands behind your back. Turn around. Turn the other way. Stay right there. Got him. Mm -hmm. okay. Am I going to jail? Yes, you are. For how long? I do not know. I don't make that determination. I'm going to double them. Deputy King is locking them so when you sit down, they don't tighten up, okay? Go ahead. Go with Deputy King. Look, look at me. You going to be cool with Deputy King and I? Huh? Thank you. I don't want to go to jail. Well, Brennan, look at me. Look at me. I have more important places I, I, un to I, un I understand. The footage, which was released by the sheriff's office, also went viral on social media, with many users appalled at the severity of the attack. It goes without saying that Joanne sustained serious injuries due to the incident, with it later being reported that she suffered from broken ribs and claims to have even developed PTSD. In direct response to the situation, Sheriff Rick Staley issued an official press release condemning the teenager, stating, The actions of this student are absolutely horrendous and completely uncalled for. 
Our schools should be a safe place for both employees and students. Unsurprisingly, due to the severity of this incident, Brendan would be tried as an adult, despite protests from his legal counsel. They entered into a plea deal in late 2023, and as more details surrounding his upbringing emerged, the more clear it became that this outburst could have been prevented. During the legal proceedings, Fox News found documentation that the teen had three prior misdemeanor battery charges, all occurring in 2019, with the only punishment shown for them being that he had to complete a special program designed for juveniles in an attempt to correct his behavior. His mother also revealed a significant amount of information in her defense of him. According to her, he was on several medications and suffered from autism and a slew of mental health issues, elaborating on this further in an interview with Law and Crime that took place a year after his initial arrest. Well, Brendan um, is diagnosed with autism and um, he originally was diagnosed as a level two, but the last uh, evaluation, they diagnosed him as a level three. He um, also has other diagnoses as well. He's got ADHD. He's got a generalized anxiety disorder. He's got um, explosive, um, intermittent explosive disorder. In April of 2024, Deppa's mother took this defense a step further and actually launched her own lawsuit against the school district, making the case that despite being aware of his mental state, they did nothing to prevent or treat his condition, even after being repeatedly told by her or the mother. The filing was summarized in an article by Law and Crime, which revealed that the incident had escalated due to Brendan spitting on Miss Nadich. She became upset and left the classroom, which is when the student violently attacked her. In reference to the events leading up to the assault, the filing states, the paraprofessional should not have interacted with the student in this manner. While her anger at Brendan for being spit on is understandable, her response is not an evidence-based intervention to address the spitting or defiance by Brendan. While all of this does provide important context, it certainly isn't even close to a justification for how severe Brendan's actions were. However, that being said, there were certainly steps that could have been taken to avoid this volatile situation. Staff should have definitely been made aware bro had violent triggers. Joanne herself confirmed to the local news outlet WESH2 that she hadn't been informed of the teenager's condition and had not been taught proper de-escalation techniques. If this is true, it makes the story all the more tragic, seeing as how it could have been prevented. Despite his legal team's best efforts, Brendan was sentenced to five years in prison, with the presiding judge making it a point that he had not properly apologized once during the proceedings for what he had done, with it being hard to believe that the initial catalyst for all of the this occurring was simply a Nintendo Switch. Nintendo Duck Hunt gun was used in a hold up convenience store for $300. <laughs> That's fucking hilarious. Yeah. Now, I wanna when the Nintendo Entertainment System was first released in America in 1985, the game Duck Hunt was often included as a pack-in title. By proxy, it became one of the most iconic video games of all time. As you all know, Duck Hunt came with a plastic toy remote gun called the Zapper, and that was used to shoot the ducks that appeared on your TV screen while playing the game, something that was both immersive and novel for the time. Now, straight out of the box, the Zapper looks nothing like a real gun. You know, it's got that eight retro future look. It's got a bright orange trigger. What I'm getting at here is that if you were in the market for something that looked like a real gun for whatever reason that might be, the Nintendo Zapper isn't your best option. But that wouldn't stop a man nearly 40 years after the release of the Zapper from using it to rob a convenience store. In May of 2023, a 25-year-old South Carolina native by the name of David Joseph D'Alessandro walked into a gas station in the small town of Sharon located in York County. According to the Sheriff's Department, David robbed the store at 5.54 p.m. and stole $300 from the cash register after flashing a firearm. Confusingly, the report also states that the man was not only wearing a mask and a hoodie, as one might expect, but also a wig. Bro had the whole costume rack on during the robbery. Despite initially escaping, the man was quickly caught by officers at a nearby Dollar General, being arrested on the spot. This is where the officers made a shocking discovery. The alleged gun in question was actually just an NES zapper spray painted black in order to make it look more realistic. Aside from the sheer stupidity of committing the crime in the first place, you would think at the very least he would have used something more real looking. Like people have painted fucking 
fucking blocks of wood that look like more of a real gun than this. Or, you know, you could just use an airsoft gun or a BB pistol. Presumably, since he was robbing a gas station, it could be inferred that he simply didn't have the money for a real gun or a quality replica and just used whatever was lying around in his basement. So obviously, this is just my own theory. While the story is ridiculous, the fact that he had successfully carried out the robbery was enough for him to land serious criminal charges. Yeah, the gun was fake, but the clerk at the gas station certainly didn't think it was in the moment and feared for their life. And he did take money, so Delisandro was charged as if he had committed a crime with an actual firearm. According to an article by USA Today, he was held in jail without bond following the incident. The jury found that Intercom Sacramento's water drinking contest was 100% at fault in the tragic death of Jennifer Strange. The Nintendo Wii is undeniably one of the most popular gaming consoles ever. It's, at the time, novel motion control mechanics, slew of iconic games, and relatively affordable price during its 2006 launch resulted in an instant hit console. Wii's were flying off of shelves and many shortages occurred. In the time after the Holiday 06 release, people would do just about anything for a Nintendo Wii. Which brings us to the bizarrely tragic tale of Wii for Wii, a radio show contest with a Nintendo Wii prize gone horribly wrong. In January of 2007, the hype surrounding the Wii was at an all-time high, and the buzz surrounding this popular console led to a Sacramento, California radio station called KDND taking an interest in the craze. They decided to host a seemingly innocuous contest to drum up good publicity, while also giving the public a chance to win the iconic Nintendo gaming system. The idea was simple. Contestants would enter, being given large quantities of water to drink, with the person who was able to go on the longest without having to leave for a bathroom break winning a Nintendo Wii. They titled the contest Wii for Wii, and on the surface it seemed like a simple and safe idea for a fun giveaway. After all, I mean, conventional wisdom states that water is a necessity, and one would think that drinking it in large quantities would be completely safe with no negative repercussions. This is what led 28-year-old Jennifer Strange to enter the contest, believing she had a shot at winning. Seeing as how she was the mother of three children, it made sense that she would be more dedicated than most. At the start of the contest, participants were directed to drink an 8-ounce bottle of water every 15 minutes. Even this initial requirement is problematic in terms of one's health. The daily recommended amount of water for an adult woman is 2.7 liters, with the body only able to get rid of a maximum of 1 liter or 33 ounces of fluid per hour. If we do the calculations, this means the contestants were being forced to drink the maximum amount of water the body can physically process every hour. This combined with the fact that they weren't doing any sort of intense exercise and intentionally didn't go to the bathroom to flush the water out of their system meant that they were unwittingly opening themselves up to severe poisoning. As the contest dragged on and eight entire rounds went by, several participants quit, but Jennifer continued, determined to win the Wii. This is when radio staff decided to up the ante, allegedly giving the remaining few even larger bottles of water. These were a whopping half liter each, an almost comical amount of water was being chugged by these contestants. It was a blatant example of gross negligence on the part of the radio station, with medical professionals even calling in to warn the hosts about the dangers of the contest while they were live. These warnings were brushed off, with the reasoning being that the participants signed waivers. A nurse calls in to warn of the dangers of the contest, but the DJs don't respond. I want to say that, um, that those people that are drinking all that water can get sick and possibly die from water intoxication. Yeah, we're aware of that. We're, that's yeah, they they signed releases, so we're not responsible. It's okay. It was later calculated that she had drank over seven liters of water, which proved to have had deadly consequences. On the drive home, she even complained of experiencing headaches and general sickness, with her last broadcasted moments being included in a local news story later on. Yesterday, CBS 13 obtained a copy of that contest. My head hurts. Aww. They keep telling me that it's the, the water, that it's my, it'll tell my head to hurt and then it'll make me puke. Jennifer was later found dead in her home, 
with the coroners discovering that she had in fact died from water toxicity or water poisoning. This was absolutely devastating to her family as well as the local community, with one of the DJs releasing a statement on social media soon after extending his condolences for what had happened. Well, one of the DJs just released a statement on his MySpace page. This is Stephen Manny's and it says, at this time, we would like to express our deepest condolences to the family of Jennifer Strange. We want to thank all of our listeners for their continued support, and we ask that you join us by keeping Jennifer and her family in, our th in your thoughts and prayers, Lucas, Manny, and Trish. It was a case of gross negligence. If the radio station had done even basic research, they could have limited the water quantities to safe levels and still have held the competition. Instead, their refusal to listen to medical professionals led to the death of an innocent woman. Numerous mainstream publications covered the story, making national headlines. It was even covered on the O'Reilly Factor at the time. Jennifer, I heard that it's not, you're not doing too well. My head hurts. Aww. They keep telling me that it's the, the water, that it's my, it'll tell my head to hurt and then it'll make me puke, but. I, who, who told you that, the intern? Yeah. That's one of the notes over there? Like, it kind of, it makes you, it hurts, but it makes you feel lightheaded, so I'm not sure if I'm just like. This is what it feels like when you're drowning. There's a lot of water inside of you. Oh, it hurts. Yeah, and she died shortly after that. She died. She ultimately was the second to last person involved in the contest. They gave her consolation tickets of a Justin Timberlake uh, ticket, concert tickets, right. uh, and she took it, and she would never make that concert. She how, would be dead how long within after six hours. that uh, radio thing? Within six hours, she was six dead. Hours. Mother because of she, three. She uh, consumed two gallons of water, I understand, right? Just under. And uh, your system simply can't absorb it. So they weren't allowed to go to the bathroom. That was the contest. Right, and, right. and they would win w one of those wee electronic games. So there's While the DJs responsible were immediately fired, this wasn't enough for Jennifer's grieving family. Her husband, Billy, sued the conglomerate media company behind the stunt, with a jury eventually ruling in his favor and awarding him with $16.5 million. Of course, this didn't even come close to making up for the loss of his wife, but this case did at the very least boost public awareness surrounding excessive water consumption. This is one of the most infamous cases of its kind, still serving as a devastating reminder of negligence to this very day. They're saying you killed the professor. Did you do this? Over the past few decades, as the world has become more and more connected through the internet, police have kept with the trends and have consistently used technology to find and capture criminals. While the vast majority of cases have to do with phone usage, one incident involving a Nintendo Switch console helped solve a seemingly unsolvable murder case. In November of 2019, the local community in Mobile, Alabama was shocked after it was discovered that a 39-year-old economics professor named Matthew White had been shot and killed inside of his home after what appeared to be a robbery gone wrong. He had worked at the University of South Alabama with the dean of the school, Bob Wood, giving a heartfelt eulogy soon after his colleague's death, stating, quote, It's with a heavy heart that I write to inform you of the untimely passing of our colleague and friend, Dr. Matthew Weiser, assistant professor in the Department of Economics and Finance. Matt has been a member of our MCOB team since 2014. He was highly respected and well-liked by all members of the campus community and will be greatly missed. However, despite law enforcement's desire to catch the criminals responsible, they had absolutely no leads to go off of, with the case stagnating for a time. According to WKRG News, they even offered a $5,000 reward for anyone who could provide a tip that might lead to them solving the case. However, this would end up being unnecessary. Apparently, one of the possessions that had been stolen from the teacher was a Nintendo Switch. On its own, this doesn't seem like something that would lead to the crime being solved. However, authorities caught wind of a possible lead after the console was connected to a Wi-Fi network. This led to them arresting two 20-year-old men in connection to the crime. Tyquez Timmons and Derek Scott. Local outlets soon reported on the case, with more details surrounding the criminal's behavior being elaborated on by Assistant District Attorney Keith Blackwood. Timmons would uh, drop off Scott to go burglarize houses and then uh, would pick him up and they would 
repeat the behavior somewhere else. And in this case, Professor Weiser uh, was home and, and murdered uh, because these two wanted to conspire together, allegedly to commit some burglaries. The two young men were facing felony murder charges and were given $150,000 bonds each, with the provision that if that amount was paid, they would be put on house arrest. Despite these developments, there was still some mystery surrounding the case. For starters, most of the news outlets reporting on the situation were not privy to exactly how the switch had led to them to the doorsteps of the two alleged criminals. However, this was later elaborated upon by Blackwood himself once again, with him stating, quote, it was connected to an IP address that detectives were able to locate who the IP address is registered to, talk to that person, who then led them to the defendant, Tyquez Timmons. That led them to Derek Scott, unquote. The final update was reported on in February of 2020. It turns out that the two had a third accomplice, a 23-year-old named Curtis Anthony Womack Jr. While his exact role is unclear, it was revealed that Derek Scott had been the one who actually pulled the trigger and killed the professor. Authorities also alleged that Timmons had a GPS in his vehicle that also showed he was in the area at the time of the murder. With all this adding up together, it's very unlikely those involved got away without any severe punishment, though it's unclear exactly what they were specifically charged with as coverage of the story dried up after this. The man who sent 39 bomb and death threats to Nintendo was sentenced to one year in prison, four years suspended. If you've ever played online games with even a hint of competitiveness, you know that salty feeling you get when you are hit with a losing streak. I just can't do it. I can't take this shit no more, man. And while you might be angry in the moment, most rational people realize it's not worth getting super upset over something as trivial as losing in a game. But one Japanese man seemed to lack the ability to see that or come to that conclusion. Our story begins with a 27-year-old man named Kenshin Kazama, who lived in the city of Hitachi located in the Abaraki Prefecture. On the surface, he was a normal man working a mundane job as a city official. However, he, like many others, had a penchant for gaming. Being a huge fan of Nintendo's Splatoon franchise. Seeing as how it's a third-person shooter, it can indeed get very competitive and difficult at times, with Kazama often losing his temper while playing. As reported by several news outlets, he became so infuriated that he decided to give Nintendo a piece of his mind. But rather than sending stern letters expressing his frustrations, he instead decided to violently threaten them numerous times. He apparently did this via the customer service forum located on the Nintendo website, submitting a whopping 39 separate threats beginning in August of 2023 and ending in September of that same year. Obviously, this on its own would be concerning enough, but there was another reason as to why this sounded so many alarm bells. He had specifically mentioned two separate events, with one being Nintendo Live 2024, which would have taken place in January, and an official Nintendo-sponsored tournament called Splatoon Koshien, which would have taken place in December of 2023. The threats were taken very seriously at the time, with Nintendo rescheduling both of these events for later dates. It didn't take long for authorities to discover who the man was, with him quickly being outed and brought before a court. The judge presiding over the case was unsympathetic to the man's feeble defense of being frustrated within online games, stating, quote, the defendant was frustrated by his repeated losses in online matches of Nintendo games and committed the crime to relieve stress. There is nothing to be found in the selfish motive. The crime was persistent and malicious. Bro was getting camped by the enemy team and got salty and rage quit. That's the end of the case. I'm just kidding, he didn't say that last part, but yeah. The irate gamer was sentenced to serve a year in prison with four months of probation, in addition to being fined $4.36 million in an effort to recoup some of Nintendo's losses. She's going, Mom, help me, get me away from him, Mom, save me. So I pulled out of the parking lot, I mean the parking spot, all things considered, the PlayStation 5 is a pretty fucking expensive video game console, like $500 at release? Come on, dude. But in the time around COVID and shortly after it, everyone wanted this thing, and some people had to wait literal years to get one due to the PS5 shortage that occurred. This next story is a case of a man who nearly four years after console release was preparing to get his very own PlayStation 5. But when his wife orders a Nintendo Switch instead, an un hinged freakout ensues, resulting in the man's own death. 
Before we dive into the story, keep in mind that it wasn't reported on by many major outlets, with the vast majority of information surrounding this case coming from local news station Fox 17. So all credit to them for what they found. In March of 2024, a 45-year-old man from Holland, Michigan named Robert Leon got into a heated argument with his wife, Venice. Allegedly, the argument started because she had ordered a Nintendo Switch instead of a PlayStation 5 like he had requested. So this causes him to completely lose it, screaming and allegedly going so far as to physically hurt her while their daughter was in the back seat. The woman repeatedly tried de-escalating the situation, trying to tell her irate husband that she could simply return the Switch and still get a PS5. But he wasn't listening. She was terrified, with the man soon leaving the car and storming off. Due to her daughter's crying, Venice decided it would be best to drive away to the nearby parking lot of a grocery store to, you know, allow her husband some time to calm down. But upon seeing this, Leon leapt in front of the truck and he started to bang on the window. Panicking, his wife continued to drive, knocking Leon over in the process. He hit his head and was soon driven to the hospital after being hit. He suffered from an inoperable brain injury that resulted in him passing away. She was later interviewed, providing testimony as to what had happened and breaking down into tears numerous times. He got really upset. Like, I've never seen him like that. I've never seen him fly off the handle like that. I've never seen him. I don't know why he got so angry, but then he started uh, like telling me, I'm, you know, calling me names and, and being very aggressive. And he scared my daughter. She like screamed at the top of her lungs. She's going, mom, help me, get me away from him, mom, save me. So I pulled out of the parking lot. I mean, the parking spot. So I was pulling out, he jumped on the hood and he was holding on like where the window wipers are. And uh, I had proceeded to turn, and as I turned, he slipped off and he fell and hit his head. And that's what caused him to pass away as he got a brain bleed that was inoperable and they couldn't fix it. It's unclear why the man had grown so angry after hearing he would not be receiving a PS5 and getting a Switch instead. Based on her reaction to his death and her own testimony, it doesn't appear that he had been involved in any pattern of abuse, with this behavior seemingly coming out of nowhere. It's possible that we may never know the exact details of what transpired on that day, but it's a tragic story nonetheless, with the woman now having to cope with the past passing of her husband over a seemingly trivial matter. And well, you've made it to the end. Let me know what you guys thought about this video down below in the comments section, and let me know who or what you want me to talk about next. I want to give a major shout out to my patrons. I appreciate you guys. Wavy Web Surf out. Peace.